Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Day. Hi. Lots to be getting on with. This is episode 126 of the Kiwi Mana Buzz Beekeeping Show. Yes, and we're Gary and Margaret, and we love honeybees, and we are Kiwi Mana, and we are beekeepers who live in the Watakri Ranges on the wild west coast of Auckland in New Zealand. Kiwi Mana is a place where the beekeeping community can share a conversation and connect, and in this episode we talk about fascinating and interesting honeybee facts and beekeeping news. Being too close may cause hive losses. Yeah, interesting, that one. And who got kicked out of the farmer's market? Oh, very intriguing. Absolutely. And if this wasn't enough, we build and sell beekeeping supplies so we can provide you with this podcast and it helps supplement our work and our blogs and everything like that. We teach beekeepers who are beginners and provide beekeeper services and advice. And we are the Bees Needs Club on Facebook. That's right, and it's great to have you joining us. We know life is busy, and so we appreciate you've taken the time to join us today. Thanks so much for being part of the Kiwi Mana. That's what's going on in my hives at the moment, especially when I tap the side of the hive. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so we've also been known to go off on a tangent about other issues. Boy, you're going to love this one. Yes, it's winter here in New Zealand, as I've said, and what has been happening? Well, there's been a lot of rain, and this means the bees are dealing with all this weather. Yeah, and temperatures have varied from about 5 degrees up to 34 degrees over winter this year. So it's been a very interesting time, and the girls don't seem to be stopping. They just seem to keep going. Yeah, I've noticed that, and when it's a nice day, they're all out, eh? Yeah, today they were very excited, and um, we're out there doing their thing, and uh, lots of pollen coming in. And yeah, feeling a bit excited and nervous at the same time. Absolutely, it's been cold. Okay, over the winter break, I actually updated the free beekeeping top podcast post on our blog, and we have three new shows, and here's some short promos. First up, there's Bee Sotted by Nigel Costley from Nelson in New Zealand. Hello and welcome to Bee Sotted. I'm Nigel Costley, a beekeeper from Nelson. I tutor a Level 3 beekeeping course through Taratahi Agricultural Training Centre, who kindly sponsor these programs. Today I want to tell the story of Langstroth, the Reverend Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth to be exact. And second up, we've got a podcast from Norfolk in the UK. It's called... Beekeeping Short and Sweet. It's a beekeeping podcast with beekeepers with a short attention span because the shows are only about 15 minutes long. Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 21 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week, it's all about the Nico queen rearing system. And finally, we've got from Bee Culture magazine in the USA, we've got the Beekeeping Today podcast with host Jeff Oat and Kim Flodham from North America. And Kim's obviously the editor of Bee Culture. So it's got some great uh, information there for American beekeepers. So welcome, guys, to the world of podcasting. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture, a magazine of American beekeeping. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flott, I'm editor of Bee Culture magazine. And we hope you can check them all out, and that's at kiwi.bz slash top pods. And on a personal note, it's great to see another podcaster in New Zealand. So welcome to the podcasting world, Nigel. Okay, and WTF, AFB levies in New Zealand are going up, apparently, or they're proposed to go up. Uh, not, they're not definitely going up. And Margaret has been investigating this. What did you find? Yeah, I'll go into that a bit more as we go along, Gary. Okay, so what's been happening with you, Margaret? Well, um, it's been glim and cold, I agree, absolutely. And my feet are cold at the moment. So, uh, yeah, still dealing with that. The girls are fine. They have been really active, as I said, over winter. And I'm seeing a lot of activity out there. So as soon as I get some really warm day, I'm going to go out and open them up because I haven't opened them up. I've just been doing the treatments. And um, we're preparing for spring. 
and getting a new stock and preparing for the arrival of bees and some nucleus colonies, which a commercial guy is making up for us. So that's awesome. We have to prepare a submission letter in response to this AFB proposal to increase, yes, increase beekeeping fees across New Zealand. So I put a link on there to the actual proposal, the details of the proposal, and I've also put a link to the online form where they do ask you quite a few questions, but you can actually put a written submission in as well. And I think that, you know, we all pay to get our DECA and no one helps fund us to do that. And we as Kiwi Mana work hard to create awareness of the threats and issues facing honeybees through our our coursework, our blogs, you know, all our work we do with the podcasts and blogs and everything. And we share what are considered the best beekeeper hygiene practices so that hobbyists don't spread AFB. So we feel that we are contributing to what is going on. Um, We're paying to support basically an agency that doesn't really uh, support hobbyists, in my view. Everyone should make a submission, put your views across. Anything that is constructive or helpful to them, make them aware whether you are happy or unhappy or are you satisfied with the service that is happening because elimination of AFB I think is really an an impossible venture because it's going to sit, the spores will sit in the ground, that's what I understand, for around 40 years. So are they going to start fumigating the land where the AFB has been found. I think that they are better off to do educational programs and and go to every single bee club in New Zealand and do training and education. I think this is all, you know, more of a, a central government responsibility. They need to increase staff levels to cover all this, what the demands of this industry, which is bringing huge amount of money into New Zealand. And obvious beekeepers are only a little portion of that. So maybe they need to consider splitting up and identifying hobbyists versus commercials and then have a look at, you know, which percentage of cores is from either sector And also maybe knuckling down on these commercial guys who are constantly getting AFB. They're doing something wrong. Yes, I agree. Well, I I know that there's people from agency have talked at bee clubs and recently someone, one of them talked at their walk with bee club. So they, they are out there. I mean, how much of a risk is it that AFB in the soil, do you think? Who knows? I don't know. They, they should know. The agency should know. Central government need to deal with pest management strategies and just setting up an agency and giving them a few people in there is just, it's ridiculous. They need to have a proper staff level to manage what is going on here. But it should be funded by our tax dollars, basically, because this is an industry that's contributing to the economy. So I think deal with that first and then start creating some on the 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 way that they look at who beekeepers are and start identifying and really going down to the, the ground, as it were, to find out who is causing the most issues. If it's both parties, then they really need to do a really good educational and awareness program. Yes, indeed. Well, let's uh, let's. There's obviously more to this than we uh, can talk about here, so we'll have to find out about that. Yes, because we have lots to be getting on with. Okay. Well, I, I encourage everyone to put a submission in, and we will have more details with that. We'll try and get someone from the agency on the show. <laughs> Oh, okay. oh, 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 this is so exciting, isn't it? It is exciting because last last show we asked for some reporters in the field, Kiwi Mana roving reporters, and we got two, two roving reporters. Yeah, and this is Joe from North Hampshire in the UK, and you can follow Joe on... Bizzlebugs on Twitters, on, the t- on Twitter. On the Twitters? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's what our roving reporter, Joe, has to share with you. Good morning, Gary and Margaret, and to all the uh, Kiwi Mana fans as well. Um, my name's Joe Ibbotson. 
out beekeeping by myself today. I'd normally be with my brother, Chris, but he's otherwise uh, disposed of. So just me on my Jack Jones today, and I am sweating my conkers off. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know the UK, which is where I live, in Northamptonshire, it's been freaking boiling here, and a bit of a drought as well. Um, which kind of brings me to, uh, to a good piece of advice, which is to get water into your apiary. So use a tub or uh, a bucket or something with some rocks in or a floating piece of polystyrene so the bees, if they do go and get water, they, if they fall in, they can get back out again. Um, I'm currently reducing hives. I'm making sure the entrances are small enough so that uh, wasps can't get in and they can better defend their entrance. And um, it's now the end of the swarm season and the end of the um, early year flows. So I'm reducing things down a touch, taking off any excess honey and making sure they've got about enough honey that would see them through winter to see them through the dark at the moment. Um, other things that I'm doing are just doing a general health check of the brood nest um, because I'm treatment free, or we're treatment free. And we just like to make sure that everything is A-OK, uh, especially as uh, the population's at its peak and mite count should potentially be working its way up into its highest as well. Uh, so if you are a treating beekeeper, this might be a good time to start making your observations on uh, what you might fall is, etc. Anyway, enjoy your weekend, guys, and uh, have fun beekeeping. And uh, I look forward to the next show. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sweating my conkers off. What does that mean? Well, that's very interesting, Joe. And yeah, that is awesome to get that feedback. And yeah, thank you for reporting live from the UK. That was awesome. I could even hear birds in the background. Awesome. So what's next, Gary? Well, we've got an, another message from a 15-year-old roving reporter, Avaria, from Rascal's Apiary in North Carolina. Let's see what she says. Hello, Kiwi Mana. This is Avery from Rascal's Apiary in northeastern North Carolina. Lately, our weather has been super hot with high humidity as well. We've gotten some rain, but mainly beekeepers in my area should be focusing on controlling and keeping track of small hive beetle problems making sure that their bees have access to water, keeping track of queen progress, and making sure that they're doing well, producing a lot of eggs. If not, beekeepers may need to requeen during this time. This is also the beginning of treating varroa, so treatment should be starting pretty soon. Beekeepers may also harvest honey if they would like, since honey stores should be pretty high right now. Thank you for your time. It's awesome. And, oh, and, that's, uh, wow. And it's, I think it's from Rascal's Apri. Oh, Rascal, sorry. <laughs> and and Avara is 15 and she's going to be 16 in this, in this July. So that's probably, uh, she's already probably had that. So happy birthday from us. Happy birthday to uh, Avery. And she also goes on to say, I be here with my parents and my older brother. So, oh, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Avery. That's awesome. Yeah, cheers for that. And, and happy that, birthday. That's it. And uh, reporting live from North Carolina. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. So do you want to be a roving reporter? Yes, it'd be awesome if you could be part of help create the Kiwimana buzz like Avery and Joe did. So if you want to be a roving reporter, please just send us a quick update like one or two minutes on your phone and email it to me at gary at kiwimana.co.nz. Yeah, so you could report in from your location whilst in the field. That's right, and you could be on the next show. That's right. Yeah, it won't take long, so... Be a roving reporter. That's it. Okay. So what should you be doing with your bees? Hmm, good question, Gary. Well, I I think that swarming is going to start because there's drone broods around. I think drones are going to start hatching, and when drones start hatching, hives start splitting. Yeah, well, in New Zealand, you need to spring into action. Start with a full assessment inspection of your colonies to get a status of where they are. Then go back two weeks later and check progress of brood and bee health and for any signs of disease, for example AFB, so it's not spread through your splits or swarms. So they need to be disease free. There's a handy hint here, Gary. What is that? When drone brood appears... Remember that it takes 10 days after the drones hatch for them to mature. Split only when the drones are mature. When assessing, make sure it's safe to do so and do not chill your brood. That's right. You don't want to 
crack open the brood and then it's a very cold day, you're going to kill them, basically. You might freeze your conkers. <laughs> That's it. No conquering to be done. <laughs> okay, so the best advice from us is to assume you have to split. Especially if you want to keep your surviving queen genetics, which a lot of people are really trying to do these days, both in America, UK and here in New Zealand. So that's awesome, guys. And our advice is to have your split gear ready and built. Take it with you to the hive or hives, plus a queen excluder or excluders if you plan to split. And you use that for the 24-hour queen separation method, which is used to kick start the queen raising instinct. And this method requires the existing queen to be moved away. And why is that, Gary? She'll think she's swarmed. She will just carry on laying as usual. But, yeah, so check out the split article at kiwi.bz slash split. Awesome. Okay. Well, understanding that hobbyist beekeepers have the luxury of deciding to keep building on their healthy surviving genetics, you know, because a lot of commercial guys aren't doing that. So this is really a real luxury for us uh, hobbyists. Okay, and here are some of the benefits. If you keep your older queen, she can carry on as usual and she's a great resource because her colony will build up just normally. They'll start producing a lot of honey and resources and pollens and they'll just keep doing that. And that means that You can use that if you need to have any like replacement queens or you want them to raise new queens, that kind of thing. You've got food there, everything like that if you need it. And usually this colony just really does produce well through the rest of the season as long as the beekeeper manages the space well. Awesome. So in the UK, well, as you know, Joe, our roving reporter, said that they were having a heat wave and drought. And the season probably is going on longer due to the heat and may find feeding is required if there is a dearth and the bees haven't got enough stores as they start moving into autumn. And he also talked about the water, dealing with providing them with water and they're starting to winter down there as well. And what about in the USA, Gary? Well, they're having a lot of fires, aren't they? Wildfires all over the place. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of people are planning for wintering down already. Varroa needs to be dealt with before laying finishes, and cell checks are necessary to ensure varroa are not hiding. And they'll always be hiding, won't they? Let's be yeah. Honest. And let's face it, natural mite falls on inspection boards will not be enough at this time. What do you think is more precise, Gary? I think you should probably do a sugar shake. Also check drone cells for varroa mites and also check worker cells. And why would you do a sugar shake? I just think to get a a more accurate uh, figure. Okay, yeah, I agree. I think it's more precise if you do that. And when, when there's cell checks done, it's actually opening up and having a look inside and we'll go over that a bit more and the point is is that in the USA a lot of colonies fail in autumn because beekeepers appear to be using the broodless theory. You know, they say that they're because they're not going to lay, they're not going to get varroa. But if they've got varroa in the the cells, then they are going to have varroa. And that's what's causing the colony failure because they were still present in the hive and already had transferred viruses. And beekeepers need to be aware that varroa are resistant. Well, the other thing is that the, the varroa that's in the hive may be walking on the bees. And and they spend their time over winter eating the bees' uh, fat cells, don't they? Or the yeah. hemoglobin. So that's, so that's and that's the worst thing because those bees need that resource for themselves. Indeed, and and I think that the other thing about varroa is it's established here in New Zealand that they are resistant to these synthetic treatments. So even though people are saying, "Oh, we only treat twice a year," well. You know, it's not working and the treatments aren't working long enough now and people are just saying that the varroa become on, come on stronger and so they're more resistant, they're spreading viruses which are stronger and can kill a colony a lot sooner. So they're not effective today as they were 20 years ago. So this means hives are going into winter weakened and sick and sugar syrup feeding does not add the right nutrition to the colony's health. Okay. Yes, and we would encourage looking at organic treatments while temperatures are warmer in early autumn, like Apilofar, or using oxalic acid vaporization, 
Which we used throughout winter, didn't you? Yeah, we've done it throughout winter, the last two winters, and it's been very successful. But you you need to keep on top of it. You need to keep doing Varroa checks, actually checking inside the cells. So handy hint, we use our capping scratcher for the cell checks. The capping scratchers will help you pull out the larvae and Varroa are usually at the end of the larvae itself or at the bottom of the cell. And we put a link to our article called Infested. So there's some really good photos in there that's, uh, you know, a few years old, but you might find that of interest. Yep, it may be three years old, but the mites are still there. Indeed. Okay, blog recap. This is the top content voted by you. And number one post last month was Beekeeping Banter, episode 124. That was the uh, roundup, wasn't it, of the, the last show before the winter? Yeah, it was. And uh, yeah, great, guys. Awesome. And the second one was the day the show got hijacked. That was when Yappy the Bee Man was interviewing us. What did you guys think of that show? Obviously, you'd liked it a bit because there was a lot of downloads. But yeah, what did you think? Drop us a line. I'll leave a comment on the show note. Yeah, awesome. And the other one that was um, that you guys really liked was called Seven Plants That Repel Unwanted Insects, But Not Bees. Yes, that was a guest post from Hannah Thomas. So thanks, Hannah, for writing that article for us. Awesome. So it's great. You know, it's great to get some support like that with these articles. Yes, and what tools have we been using in our work? Well, not much. I've been using the, um, the axe to chop up firewood. Um, chainsaw to cut up trees. <laughs> uh, Gum boots to walk through the mud. Through the mud. And, and s- snow to help protect you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been busy working on the website and podcast, as I said before. So what have you been using, Margaret? Well, mainly my vaporizer, um, the gel battery that I have with it, and just carrying on doing my oxalic acid vaporization treatments through winter and my battery charger afterwards and before I use it. And, of course, my good old go-to, my suit and gloves to protect me because sometimes the wintering bees don't like us to go near their hive. No, they're a bit, <laughs> they get a bit angry. <laughs> angry girls. Ooh. But they're feisty, so they're fighting off those wasps. Yeah, it's awesome. They actually have been dealing really well with the wasps this year. And the wasps aren't doing too well with all this blooming rain. No, exactly. So nothing like the weather. Beekeeping news. News you cannot lose. And this podcast was made possible by our amazing supporters and patrons, especially this month. We'd like to thank Christopher Brown. And Christopher and Laura have been supporting the Kiwi Mana Buzz since October 2016. Thanks, guys. You're awfully formal because he likes to be called Chris, I think. We're calling him Christopher because... Um, it's very serious business, this beekeeping business. It's the year business. of the raw wedding, so we have to be very... Appropriate. Appropriate. <laughs> and he's recently been in Amsterdam, so that was good. You're the, your, uh, your family's hometown, Dale. Indeed, Amundo. And we hope all is well at Brit Mana for Laura, Jasper, and of course, Maggie. Yeah, and we hope the bees have been doing well for you guys and uh, you're enjoying a bit of this warm weather and hope the bees get through this because it's been pretty blimmin' hot where you guys are. Yes, indeed. And the first story is from the UK. Beekeeper rivalry. Arson attack killed 700,000 bees. What's this about? This is from Selinge in a civil parish and village on the A20 road between Ashford and Folkestone in Kent, South East England. This article talks about thieving mongrels in UK, taking someone else's hard work for their own ends. It goes on to ask for help that may identify the perpetrators. So Michaela Tullett, owner of the attacked apiary, speaks out about how she felt about the how she felt after the attack. The initial feeling after the arson attack was shock that it had happened again, following by a feeling of numbness. Oh, she'd been attacked. Has it been attacked twice? Yes, this is the second attack. Oh, man. 
Michaela goes on to say, like a typical courageous beekeeper, Although this is a devastating blow to us, it's not enough to make us go out of business. So it was that was the intention of the arsonist that hasn't worked. What, do they burn the hives down? Yeah. Oh, so read this article to find out more about what is going on in the UK in terms of thieving mongrels and the viciousness that it involved, was involved in this article. Yeah, this is a, um, just shows you how people are awful. Yeah, and because this, they think, they suspect it was a rival beekeeper, don't they? Yeah, they haven't quite been able to identify that that is exactly the case. So the article will, you know, give you some other information about what is happening in the UK. And, you know, I really think that, I don't know, my heart aches for those bees, you know? Yes, indeed. And we've got some feedback from Aileen Smith. You can't call yourself a beekeeper if you're willing to kill innocent bees because they aren't yours. That is disgraceful behaviour. I agree. Yeah. And Lanya Beat says, hard out, eh? What beekeeper doesn't have an attachment and love for bees that they're willing to kill off that many? Geez, I apologise if I accidentally squash a single bee and tear it up and tear up if I see a single colony dead. Amen. That's it. So Absolutely. True. And Christina Henning says, Lanya Beats, you would be surprised at how many beekeepers do beekeeping for the money and not the love of bees who are willing to sacrifice bees in the name of profit or business to eliminate the competition. It's quite disturbing and heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, but most commercial beekeepers, they all love bees, don't they? Not, you know. Yeah, just remember, guys, this has not been proven that it's a rivalry thing, but, you know, if we get any updates on it, we'll bring that to you. And Gil goes on to say, Gil Ashmed McCoy, scum that destroy beehives should be put behind bars for a very long time. Filthy, cowardly scum. <laughs> Tell us what you really think, Gil. That's it. Anyway, and Carrie Jo Thomas says, low, lame. I agree. And the next story, too big, too close, BR's risk hive loss. What's this one about? Well, this is a New Zealand news from staff.co in April 2018. And it's fair to say that I hear what Murray is saying in this article, as we had issues with overpopulation in our area, and that resulted in disease and more robbing behaviour than we had ever seen in the seasons before. There's a warning in this article for all of us beekeepers. Yeah, it's interesting eh, how they say that the fact that so many beehives in New Zealand, we're going to start getting problems like America with the, the massive losses. And, and he's talking about the uh, losses are, what, he's saying at the moment it's 10%. Uh, over winter they lose 10% of the hives, eh? but he reckons it's more like 33%. Yeah, the quote is, as demand for manuka honey peaks, so does the risk of disease and starvation in New Zealand's increasingly competitive beekeeping industry. Then the article talks about bee losses in New Zealand, and exactly as you said, Gary, it uses information gathered from MPI Bee Survey, and that's where it states the percentages. Yeah, that's shocking, eh? So, I mean, it, it, I, I guess the fact if we've got as many bees per area as America, we are going to start getting those kind of issues, aren't we? Yeah, I had a bit of a problem with the figures on the ish, on those losses. My thought is that the figure is more than the 10% that they mentioned, and I reckon it's more like 33%. Yeah, because that, what sort of percentage of beekeepers did that survey actually cover? Yeah, I think they only talked to 30%. So they said it was a 30% response from all the beekeepers in New Zealand. Yeah, so, so that's not really... I don't think that's very I much. I think it's kind of meaningless then, isn't it? In some ways, yeah. What's the other quote that, that we put there, Dale? It says, It, MPI, warns that as a number of bee colonies rises, good beekeeping practices must be maintained to prevent the devastating hive losses seen in the United States and several European countries. I agree, and have a read and let us know what you think about this. Another quote there is, J. Bush and Sons Managing Director Murray Bush, whose family has been beekeeping in Marlborough for a century, said the New Zealand industry was starting to look a lot like the industries in countries that were struggling. Mm. So, yeah, many bees, not enough food. Yep, absolutely. So let's hope... Uh 
that's something something happens about that. Well, Darla, I went on on a bit of a tangent while reading this article because there was a link on the article to another article about eight native plants that pollinators love. Well, it has to be read. You know what I mean? Then my head went on to another tangent, which was about industrial dairy farms. Yeah, please listen, guys. You know, these industrial dairy farms where they put too many cows in a shed. Then my head went on to think about chicken farms. Oh, my goodness. Feeding processed food with hormones and grains growing with neonicotinoids on the seeds. And then my head went back to bees. Bees being fed on sugar syrup and how harmful it is to feed animals and bees with stuff that isn't normal or natural for them. And hearing how this stuff being fed to the cows and the chickens and bees, in actual fact, decreases their lifespan. So yeah, I got myself quite wound up and very angry about it all, Gary. Oh, you need to calm down, Margaret. You know, oh. I always say it's better to feed bees sugar than let them die. Well, I agree, but I think leave them their own honey. And we've got some feedback about this one from Paula Tyer Wilson. What does she say? Yeah, Paula says, as the market matures, stocking densities become an issue and larger beekeepers will eventually consolidate the market to extract the top margins. Good luck legislating for bee health and avoiding unintended market consequences. Yeah, Paula's on to it really. Is this more about corporate greed for control of these industries and the dollar ultimately only to benefit only six people on their boards? Which we can now lead to the next story, Dale. Okay, the next story is from our friend in Canada, Ron, and kicked out of a farmer's market. Yeah, this article boils my blood. Ron covered this story in May 2018, and the article talks about what happened in a farmer's market in Ontario in Canada. Maine, Canada. They're not even a real country. Oh, anyway. um, No, not blaming Canada. Tangent? (laughs) Sorry. Okay. The quote from the article says, It can be hard to sell honey. Farmer's market help. Customers looking for good local produce can buy directly from farmers and beekeepers. So farmers markets are a win-win for sellers and buyers. But if you're a beekeeper who gets kicked out of your market not for selling bad products, not because the other vendors voted you out, but because you complain that the retailers are buying from food depots, coming to the market and allegedly misrepresenting their produce by pretending that they grew what they sold. Well, an Ontario beekeeper and a few other producers were thrown out of their market by the board because the complainers were dissidents. Or as the board spelled it in its anti-complainer flyers, dissident members. <laughs> Dissient. <laughs> Dissient. Yeah, it's only some of the retailers there. And Ron asked this question, and I quote what he asked. He said, did I read that correctly? A majority of the vendors voted that the people who were defending local growing food should be allowed to stay, even though they were portrayed as dissidents by the Market Association Board's propaganda. However, the Markets Board overruled, I'm saying overruled, the democratic decision of the members and sent the bailiff a court officer, out to the farmers to be sure they got the message that they had been kicked out. Sounds like a really dysfunctional organisation, doesn't it? Hmm. It does, and the definition of dissident is someone that who opposes the official policy. So the official policy must clearly be to sell non, non-farm non food. Just get it from, Non-local, the, shop, from yeah. the supermarket. <laughs> so come on, Ron, you know. They're only following their policy. Uh, yeah, I think they need to um, go back and have a look at their policy and, and get their act together. Oh, and, this, this know, is uh, crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, accepting that there are two sides to every situation. However, I believe this is what happens when boards have other agendas. 
And we talk about that, don't we? Corporate greed and feeding animals stuff that they shouldn't be eating because it's going to affect the bottom line or whatever they call it. And then the lifespan of cows that are fed all that rubbish is like, how long? Six months or something? I don't know. Anyway, democracy, my ass. More like dictatorship with conflict of interest and some bullying behavior as well. Because then this happens. Ron goes on to write, as he understands... The, the board then sent a bailiff to each of the five farms with a letter informing the growers of the removal from the market. Why, why send a bailiff? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that to me is a bullying behaviour. Isn't a bailiff someone that collects debts from people? Yeah, yeah. And OTT, adding insult to injury to these guys who are just trying to... Trying to get along. Yeah, and we're just all trying to get along, you know, and grow our local produce and sell it to our local folk. Well, everyone knows the world's run by six corporations, do Let's be honest. Anyway, that's another tangent <laughs> that we cannot go talk about. Okay, Gary. So what's the feedback on this one? You tell me. Strangely, no feedback on this, but Margaret certainly had a lot to say. Yes, you did. <laughs> As you do for most things. Thanks, guys. Anyway, this one here, the next story is a bit more lighthearted. Yeah, 20 fascinating honeybee facts. This is a great blog post from the great blog, Carolina Honeybees. And this is written by Beekeeper Charlotte, who's been on the show, hasn't she? Yes. And it's a quote from this one. Some researchers have devoted their entire lives to the study of the honeybees. This has yielded some truly fascinating honeybee facts. And there's 20 there, and okay. we're not going to read them all, but here are my favourites. Okay, Gary, go, go, Gary. Okay, think about this. Male bees, drones, have no father, but they do have a grandfather. Larva that hatches from a honeybee egg will be fed about 1,300 times a day. Oh, and, you, and you complain that I have six meals a day. <laughs> a queen bee... Might live up to four to five years, but is usually replaced by colony much sooner. Oh, I think five years is a, probably the limit, isn't it? Well, what? I think, yeah, it's sad that they don't live as long. You know, they used to live for years. Remember when we first started beekeeping and, and we watched this King Bee talk about his queens? He said they live for seven years. The longest age we've had of a queen is four years, eh? Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's probably to do with treatments on you know and the demands and all the issues with virile mites causing less life on them i think yeah okay and going back to which one's my favorite gary out of those three 1300 times a day that surprised me eh? that's a lot it's quite a lot it's a huge amount so that's only part of them guys so have a check out of this article see what charlotte is sharing with you and we got some feedback from Charlotte Anderson, a.k.a. <laughs> Beekeeping Charlotte. Thanks, Gary. Those bees are endlessly fascinating. Absolutely, Charlotte, and your blog is endlessly fascinating as well. Yeah. Cheers for sharing that, Charlotte. So awesome. And I hope your new book is selling well. We'll put a link to your book in the show notes. Okay, let's move on. If the problem continue for the bees, I don't know if they would have made it. Yes, I don't know either. Anyway, when people join our newsletter, we ask them what their number one beekeeping problem is. We try and help them with that problem. And here is this month's problem. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm waiting. Okay, this is from Glenn Kaito. He says, one of the hives you purchased turned out to be Africanized. I need to find the queen and replace her with a gentle Italian queen. Alrighty. Every time I'm in the hive, I'm bombarded with bees trying to sting me through my jacket. May need to solicit local help. Absolutely. Okay, well, first off, I think you obviously must be newish to this. So I would highly recommend getting a local beekeeper to give you a hand. What can you do for this guy? You probably can... It's hard finding a queen anyway, isn't it? Yeah, and you'd only have eggs from that Africanized queen. And I just wonder if they would even accept a, an Italian queen. So, yeah, I think it's really important to have a talk with a few locals around or other areas who have Africanized bees and ask them how they deal with it. Well, after reading Charlotte's article, do you realize that the, the bees realize the queen's dead after 15 minutes? 
So if he gets the queen and and holds, you know, keeps him without a queen for a while, they should be okay. But one thing he could do, which we've tried before, eh, is you actually split the hive in two. You could just use a queen excluder eh, right between the two between the hive boxes and leave them for a few days, and then go back and see which one's got fresh eggs. So that'll prove which box she's in. So that makes it a little bit easier. And what will that give them do? if they separate the queen? You know, you, you've moved them to one box. And the other thing that that I think we've talked about this in the past, but you may not have heard that one, Glenn, because you've only just joined us, is what you can do is you can get a, a frame of eggs from another hive and put it in the fr- in the in the box, one of the boxes. Wait about ten minutes, and the queen will usually run to that frame because she smells someone else's pheromones. So that might be another idea. Yeah, I would recommend getting a local beekeeper to come and give you a hand if if you can. And maybe rather than having a jacket, have a full suit and gloves, strong gloves yeah. and everything. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's good to try and isolate that queen. And then from there, you can, I don't know if the weather's really hot, maybe. When you're working the hive, maybe they're a bit, you know, grumpy bees can be um, thirsty bees. So maybe there might be something like that, a spray mist, a very fine spray mist of water, which might cool them off. Maybe it's a heat-related issue. Oh, I think it's an Africanized-related issue. Because the other thing, the Africanized bees, did you hear about that lady in, I think it was oh, I think it was in Alabama or somewhere, and she got, her face got covered in bees because they were Africanized? They actually try and, like, suffocate people. Awful, awful. Why would you even get them? Jeez, Louise, but I think they well, don't have I, a choice if they're... They're in the area, and I, I don't... Yeah. It's, it'd be hard to check, wouldn't it? Jeez, Louise, I'm glad I haven't got this problem, and it's a bit out of my uh, depth. Yeah, we don't really have that problem here, Glenn, but one, another another thing you can do for the future is you could do an inspection of the bees before you buy them and just see what their temperament's like. You know, obviously, if you do it in the middle of a thunderstorm, it's not going to be a very good test. But if you go there on a nice sunny day and they're all attacking you then just say, ah, oh, I don't think I want these bees. So try and get some more uh, gentle ones. Yeah, I mean, the assumption is we, we have to make a few assumptions. So that could be that you got it from a breeder or if you got it from a swarm, it's really hard to tell until you actually start working the hive. Yep, just be careful, my advice, because they can be quite nasty. Yeah, well, that was a really good question. It got me thinking. Absolutely. If, you, if you've got a big hearing problem, you can go to kiwi.bz slash problem and type it in. And if you join our newsletter now, you get some other introduction emails now, so they've been quite popular, so it's good. Yeah, awesome. And what else can they do, Dale? They can also go to our SpeakPipe page, which is on the right-hand side of every page, and you can leave record a little, little problem, your problem on there. And for any urgent issues, where should they go? You can check out our Bees Knees Facebook group and join that and, um, yeah, put it on there. There's lots of people out there who've got um, views and ideas and a wonderful support on that group. Absolutely. You can go to beesknees.club and that will direct you straight to the Facebook page. Okay, feedback from that you guys. That was so beautiful and calm, and then you just yell into the next section. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Moving along, we're moving along. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. We have some great news, the supporters of from Patreon. We have seven new supporters over the holiday break. Wow. I'm just so impressed. You know, I think that this is autumn and we want to say thank you and so glad that you've joined the Kiwimana Buzz. Carolyn Sloan. Chris Polgrave. Simon Levitt. Gutney Hunter. Karen Shields. Tim Wilcox. And back again, John Paff. Thanks, John. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming back, John. And, you know, we appreciate everyone has a view. And we're glad that you came back. Yes, we appreciate all your support. Absolutely. And you know, guys, if you find any value in what we do, and maybe it saved you a dollar or gave you a dollar worth of help, please consider becoming a supporter. 
Absolutely, and check out our, our Patreon page at kiwi.bz slash banana. That'd be awesome. Anyway, now we'll keep moving on for supporters. We've got a great review here for, on the Apple Podcasts, and this one is from Fonta Earthstrong. That's a great name, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Five stars, and she's from she, he, uh, from the United States of America. And they titled this one Bananas for Kiwi Mana Buzz. <laughs> <laughs> It's anyway, awesome. <laughs> hello. I'll, I'll read. I'll read what they say. Okie dokie. Hello from the Pacific Northwest of Oregon. I'm a third year beekeeper with seven hives and absolutely in love with this wonderful podcast. Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? I've expanded my knowledge base tenfold from the array of guests and, of course, the incredibly wonderful info from Gary and Margaret. I love the show. Promotes many styles of beekeeping and highlights the best of who's who in the world of beekeepers. Recently, he had an eight-hour drive, and he listened to the Kiwi Mana Buzz the whole time. <laughs> oh, glutton for punishment there, I think. Anyway, it's, it's great. It really got me through. Best of all, the kids didn't even complain. In fact, thoroughly enjoyed it, even the teenagers. <laughs> My littlest is nine years old, and she's very interested in bees and keeping. She now just shouts out, Bananas! Anytime we see or hear something cool regarding bees. Thank you for your fun and light-hearted presentation of the wonderful world of beekeeping. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks, guys. It really makes, us, uh, makes, makes my day, that. I love yeah, that review. Absolutely. And what can we do? Well, give them a big banana for your support. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And Facebook. We, have, we heard from Dallas Bee Guy. He says, been listening to the Kiwimana Buzz podcast, great material and learning lots about bees. Oh, thanks, Dallas Bee Guy. That's awesome. Yeah, that's he, awesome. He must be uh, from Dallas, eh? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know, but thanks very much for getting, taking time to get back to us about it. And, uh, yeah, we hope that we bring something interesting and uh, you're enjoying it. So it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And Talking about the uh, coming up on the bonus show for the amazing supporters. This week we're talking about more pesticides for New Zealand and are beekeeping gloves really necessary? You have to you have to be a supporter to listen to that show. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. And if you want the next show to automatically appear on your podcast device, please subscribe on your podcast device or download our free application from your app store. And it's great to see Google have finally got their own uh, podcast app now, eh? So that's awesome. And, and we're on there too. Wow, you're pretty doing well there, Mr. Uh, IT guy. Oh, you've got to be up with it. And the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash 126. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, look out for new products on our next newsletter, guys. Yes, next newsletter will be coming out soon, probably this week, eh? And if no. You wanna... <laughs> It'll come out sometime in the future. It will be there, just magically. Auto-magically. Auto-magically, guys. Well, thanks, <laughs> thanks. thanks, guys, for tuning in this week, yeah. and we hope you enjoyed the uh, podcast a couple of weeks ago with Jim from Wellington. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, it was, it was good, eh? Yep, I enjoyed Had it. Had a good time. Hey, we've been watching a new series, and what's that here series called? And they love bananas, eh? <laughs> Which one's that? It's an Aussie show. Oh, middle class bogan or something? Is yeah. It? Upper middle class bogan? Yeah. yeah they we, love bananas. Because like the, the mother's played by New Zealander. Robin Malcolm, isn't it? Yeah, see, Kiwis, Aussies. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> okay, guys, we'll see you next time, eh? See ya. Nutrition to the colony's house. House. Health. What's the house? <laughs> the colony's health. Well, it has to be read. I mean, you know what, read, you know what I'm. <laughs> this is a great post from the great blog, Caroline. Carolina. See ya.